Okay, um, let's kick off. The title of this webinar is Rent in the Time of COVID, Practical Considerations for Turbulent Times. Now, having decided that rent and the 1954 Act was going to be the broad topic, uh, we suddenly realised there were about 80 subtopics that we could talk about. Um, anyway, in the limited time we have this morning, um, we've gone for two dialogues. The first will be myself and Ben Faulkner. We will touch on three areas, turnover rents, pandemic clauses, and vacancies on the high street, and how they might be factored into rental analyses. Um, ben likes to call us the A-team. Mm -hmm. um, we'll then pass over to Francesca and James McCreth, Francesca Mitchell, James McCreth, who will be talking about all manner of points arising in the context of interim rents under the 1954 Act. It goes without saying, we would love to hear from you this morning. We want this to be an exchange of views. We know there's lots of expertise in the audience. Um, do contribute, um, not least to help us to get to the bottom of points that we find uh, thoroughly tricky. Um, there may be the odd poll appear on the screen. If so, do please vote. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens to ask questions. Uh, you can ask them anonymously if you wish. Um, what we will do is have the two dialogues back to back and then deal with some questions and points for discussion at the end, and we will be done by 10.30. Without further ado, uh, Ben, shall we kick off? Let's do it, yeah. Okay, so um, Ben, well, the first of the three topics that you and I are going to cover is turnover rent, focusing in particular on whether it can be ordered under the 1954 Act. Um, but before we get to the Act, let's just remind ourselves of what turnover rents are and why we're talking about them. Sounds good. Yeah, let's okay, do it. so ordinarily a rent does not change from one period of a lease to the next, it's a fixed amount in pounds and pence. A turnover rent, on the other hand, is not fixed. It is variable, or at least it includes a variable element. That is to say, a percentage of the turnover generated from the subject premises. Yeah, and um, obviously the percentage can vary. Um, and actually, for everyone um, listening, I'd be really interested to see what kind of percentages do you typically see? Use a chat function, just let us know what sort of range of percentages you're seeing in leases at the moment where there's a turnover um, element um, and we can tidy that up at the end. Excellent. Ben is very keen on the chat function, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> do please do please use it. Um, now, turnover rents seem to be getting pretty trendy at the moment and it's perhaps worth thinking just for a moment why that might be. I'm going to throw out there at least three reasons. Number one, if one's looking at a medium to long term cause, there is, of course, the decline in bricks and mortar retail and the rise in online shopping. Uh, that's generated uncertainty and challenges, which can at least arguably be met by turnover rents, sharing between landlord and tenant the risk of that choppy retail market, but with a commensurate sharing of the upside if things go well. So that's that's one reason or cause I'm going to say. Number two, um, we also see turnover rents imposed as a consequence of CBAs. Everyone should have a look at the judgment of Mr. Justice Zaccaroli in the New Look case that came out last week. Number three, there is, of course, the elephant in the room, COVID-19, uh, which has made an uncertain situation even more difficult. Yeah, it's uncertainty that's really driving all sorts of considerations at the moment. Um, COVID-19, I've seen also is bringing a, a, another trend, which is pandemic clauses. And we're going to come on and talk about pandemic clauses uh, in a bit. But of course, if you have a turnover rent, in the event of a pandemic and the store being forced to close, no rent is going to be payable anyway. Um, and that shifts the distribution of risk um, of a pandemic from, land, uh, from tenants onto landlords, much like a pandemic clause. So there's another reason why we're starting to see turnover clauses a bit more now. Now, um, one last uh, thing, I promise, I'll stop asking questions of everybody soon, but we do have one poll for you. Um, and our question for you is, are you seeing more turnover rents at the moment? Um, or put another way, are your clients asking you to try and put them into place more? Or are you seeing them being negotiated uh, more? You go on to Lexology or Lex or whatever, and you see it all the range at the moment, but we'd be really interested to see what your experience is. Are you not really seeing them yet? Are you seeing them a bit more, a lot more? Is it, or is it just turnover madness at the moment? Uh, so do please vote. Use your buttons and do please vote. Well, there we go. So, yeah, fair bit more. Uh, the majority of you are seeing at least a bit more by way of turnover, and there's a good chunk of a lot more 
Um, and just 4% of you have gone turnover mad. So uh, there we go. That's very interesting. Excellent. I'd love to have a chat with the turnover madness people in due course. <laughs> um, OK, great. So uh, that's jolly interesting stuff. We could spend quite some time looking at the various forms of turnover rent and their various pros and cons. Perhaps a topic uh, in its own right for another day. For this morning, let's focus on whether the court can order turnover rents under the 1954 Act. Ben, I know that you're particularly excited about this issue. Sad but true is actually quite an interesting question. Um, and one reason it's really interesting is because, surprisingly, there's, there's no clear authority on this point, and the answer is far from obvious from the Act as well. I mean, this, after 67 years, this is the Act that keeps on giving. It certainly is. Um which is why we're here this morning. Now, in support of the proposition that the court does have jurisdiction to assess a turnover rent, one option, I think, would be to endeavour to, to lay weight on the legislative wording within section 34.1 and contend that it is capable of catering for a turnover rent analysis. Hayley, if you're out there, would you be kind enough to put section 34 up on the screen? Fantastic, thank you very much. So hopefully um, our audience can see section 34. And if so, you'll see that section 34.1 uh, says that the rent payable under a tenancy granted by order of the court under this part of this act shall be such as may be agreed between the landlord and tenant or in default of agreement may be determined by the court to be that at which having regard to the terms of the tenancy other than rent, the holding, and these are the words, might reasonably be expected to be let in the open market by a willing lessor. And so the argument would be that this directs the court to ask how the rent for the devised premises would be assessed in the open market if the premises were being let on the relevant valuation date. And if the court finds on the evidence present at the time of the hearing that rents in the open market for premises like the demise premises would be assessed by reference to a turnover rent, such a rent surely would be the market rent for such premises, not a rent of a fixed amount assessed by reference to traditional rental transactions. Mm -hmm. So section 34.1 is the normal basis for setting rent and it's based on what happens in the market. But here's my bright idea about a possibility, say bright, that's flat, self-flattery, but there we go, um, about an alternative uh, route, potentially, and that's section 34.3. So that's also on screen at the moment. Now section 34.3 was introduced into the Act to allow the court to make provision for varying rent, i.e. rent review clauses. We always think of section 34.3 as being about rent review clauses. Now, the cases are a bit opaque about the test under section 34.3, but it's generally regarded that rent review clauses can be ordered not as a matter of what's going on in the market, but as a matter of court discretion. And the clearest example of that is when the courts are considering whether a rent review clause should be upwards only or upwards and downwards. The courts hate upwards only rent review clauses. They consider them to be unfair to tenants. Mm -hmm. Why have it upwards only? Why should the risk be all one way? But upwards only rent review clauses are pretty much exclusively found in the market. So if you're following the market, you have upwards only, but if you have a discretion, um, the courts will order upwards and downwards and the courts order upwards and downwards almost exclusively. So that's indicating that the courts are regarding section 34.3 as a discretionary um, uh, provision and not one based in the market. Okay, so you've got a discretion on the section 34.3. Well, what's that got to do with turnover rent? Well, the turnover rent, if you think about it, is conceptually quite similar to a rent review clause. They both set the rent in future by an amount which is currently unknown, but is determined in a specified way. So in the case of a rent review clause, it's determined in future by reference to the market rents at the time. And in the case of a turnover clause, it's specified in it, it's set in, spe in future by reference to the turnover of the business. So I think there are two potential routes for um, ordering a turnover rent, either by reference to the market under section 34.1 or by court discretion under section 34.3. So um, Hayley, thank you. That's that's what we need from the Act for now. Um, and you can release the screen. So um, we're now larger than life again. Fantastic. Thank you, Hayley. Uh, and yeah, those are, those are really helpful and interesting thoughts. Ben. Um, now, look, I've been doing a bit of a trawl through the case law to see what authority there is out there. Um, in addition to the legislation that we've got, 
Now, it'd be great if the audience this morning could point us to other decisions, but traditionally, there are usually two cases that are referred to. And I'm not sure that either of them take matters a great distance. There's the old decision of Mr. Justice Brightman, as he then was in the case of Naylor and Utoxeter. Uh, that's a 1970s case concerning tenant auctioneers in respect of a cattle market in Staffordshire. Uh, now, the court was looking at the matter under Section 34.1 and determined the rent under the new tenancy of the cattle market as being 20% of the gross commission earned by the tenant, a firm of auctioneers. And implicitly, at least, that gross commission was from time to time, i.e. a variable figure, but also including a floor of base rent payable in any event. So that's one case. A second case of a similar vintage uh, and similar subject matter, Stride and Chichester. Uh, that's a 1960s case, another cattle market, this time in the cathedral city of Chichester, West Sussex. Now, this is sometimes cited as an example of the court awarding a turnover rent. However, as always with case law, it seems to me one needs to read it carefully. If you go through the decision, and it really isn't very long at all, what you see is that in fact it's the party surveyors who agreed that that was how the rent was to be assessed, i.e. the party's valuers agreed that it should be referenced by reference to turnover. Note also that the rent was to be fixed for the duration of the lease. So not expressed as a varying sum referable to percentage of turnover from time to time, but a fixed sum in the event it was approximately 10% of annual commission based on previous years. If you go to the textbooks, you'll also find the odd reference to one or two other cases, typically county court, typically unreported. So in practice, again, seems to me not taking matters in terms of precedent um, particularly far. Yeah, I mean, case law just doesn't settle it at all, which again, I find surprising, um, given that the issue is hardly new. Um, it's really just an example of the real problems which are thrown up by this Act, and, and in particular, the difficulty um, arising from the fact that all these cases are assigned to the county court, so we rarely get um, authority. So um, uh, hopefully we'll get an appeal or something um, on, on one of these cases soon, and we can um, really get our teeth stuck into it. Um, OK, well, look, let's look at then, uh, having worked out what the jurisdictional gateways for awarding turnover rents, why might the court not be able to order a turnover rent? Well, the, the main argument against them typically is that they can conflict with the express disregards in Section 34. We don't need it up again, um, but, but you would have seen that there are disregards um, upon... Uh, to, concerning the effect of rent of A, the tenant's occupation of the holding, and B, the tenant's goodwill, or the goodwill um, associated with the tenant's business. And these disregards are designed to stop the tenant from uh, overpaying rent by virtue of the fact that it's a sitting tenant already. So if you are looking at your turnover rent in the past and saying, well, this tenant has made X pounds a year for the last five years, you might say, and, and then using that to set a turnover rent, you might say that's impermissible because those disregards require you to ignore the fact that the tenant's been there for the last five years. Now, my, my view is it's worth just paying a little bit more attention to what the disregards are actually disregarding. The disregard, um, uh, what, what they do is they disregard the effect on rent of the tenant's past occupation, but not future occupation, and of the tenant's goodwill, which again is associated with the past. I'm not sure that they necessarily stop the court from ordering a turnover mechanism, which will be by reference to future turnover, whatever that may be. But here's the rub, right? We've had some really helpful responses from the audience. We're looking at a lot of 10% turnovers, sometimes 25%, someone said up to 50%, sometimes it's lower as well. Or a new look at the moment, you know, some of the junk categories are down at 6%, whatever it is. So you've got quite a range of turnover rents. How on earth is the court meant to set what that percentage is going to be if you can't look to the past trading figures in order to predict what the future trading figures are gonna be? It, it, the evaluation under the Act is between a hypothetical tenant and a hypothetical landlord. So you can't look to your specific tenant. So there's a real problem there. It may be that the court has jurisdiction to order a turnover rent, but when it comes to the percentage, it's just so completely at sea that it can't um, progress the matter any further. So I think in short, plenty to think about um, and very much look forward to 
discussing with uh, some of you in due course. Ben, the clock is ticking. I think we better move on to pandemic clauses and their effect on rent. Um, so this is the second of the three points you and I are looking at. Let's start with a reminder of what we mean by a pandemic clause. So these are clauses that provide that in the event of a pandemic, rent and or other obligations in the lease will be suspended. Yeah, um, and really quickly, of course, things are never quite that simple. They come in all sorts of forms. Uh, there are three particular things to think about with a pandemic clause. The first one is the trigger. The triggers can be different. So broadly, the trigger will be where the stores, restaurants, whatever it is, can't open because of regulations making it illegal to do so. We've all seen those regulations recently. Few uh, issues can arise. It doesn't work for essential retailers, which are allowed to maintain open, uh, to stay open, even though non-essential units all around them are forced to close. Um, and in those situations, you might have um, a slightly different trigger, perhaps by reference to what all the shops around do. But also, you've got to think about things like restaurants. A restaurant might not be able to have dine-in customers, but they can still operate as a takeaway. So what's the trigger going to be there? I mean, they come in all sorts of weird and wonderful forms. Yeah, and of course, um, there's also the question of the quantum of rent suspension. It differs. So it might be that all the rent might be suspended. It might be half of the rent suspended. There might be a three to six month cap or the rent might even switch to a turnover rent. So typically liability to pay service charges will continue, but not always. So again, there are these different contingencies. Yeah, and lastly, we need to think about other obligations as well. So a keep open covenant will obviously need to be suspended in the event of a pandemic requiring the stores um, to close, um, although the doctrine of supervening and illegality might do that anyway. But in other cases, there might be a suspension of other obligations like the tenant's obligation to repair and you know, I've seen that a couple of times, but that can be really problematic if you get a, a hole in the roof and rain starts leaking in. So um, uh, there's a lot to play for there. Absolutely. And um, particularly when it's raining well into late May. <laughs> um, so if we focus specifically on our overarching topic this morning, i.e. rent, what effect might pandemic clauses have on rent? OK, so a couple of uh, themes, two or three themes to address before we really uh, get our teeth into that question. The first is that pandemic clauses are a really hot topic at the moment. They are really new. Evidence of how they are being dealt with in the market is really quite scarce and variable. So it's going to be a while before we see definitive answers. My experience is that valuers are really struggling to deal with this and um, often end up quite a way apart on it. Now, um, secondly, no one was really thinking about pandemic clauses 18 months ago. So the fact that the pandemic clauses haven't been in existence already, we might normally be thinking something like there weren't pandemic clauses before. If a tenant now gets a pandemic clause, that is a benefit to a tenant. And because it's a benefit to the tenant, the tenant has to pay a higher rent for it. But actually, that not, that's not exactly how the market seems to be working at the moment. Instead, it might go something more like, ah, no one thought about pandemic clauses before. The scales have now fallen from our eyes. We should have had pandemic clauses all along. The market now expects to see pandemic clauses and tenants shouldn't have to pay more for something that we all realise should have formed part of normal leases. So it's now only if a lease doesn't have a pandemic clause that there should be an effect on rent. And that effect is to reduce the rent, not increase it. Indeed. I suppose there's also a third point, um, and that is that value has worked from comparables. So it's really important now to start gathering data as to whether the recent comparables in the area have pandemic clauses. If they do, but the subject premises being valued do not, then an adjustment might be warranted. If they don't, but the subject premises being valued do, then again, an adjustment might be warranted. But I do stress recent, because if the comparables are old, then the second point we just mentioned above comes into play. Um, so the absence of pandemic clauses pre-COVID might not tell us very much about their effect on rent in new leases now. OK, so that's how pandemic clauses might in principle affect rent. But what about quantifying the effects? Yeah, well, on quantum in particular, there's still a bit of shoulder shrugging and, and fingers in the air. I'm, I mean, I'm hoping we're going to get a body of cases dealing with this soon. Um, there's one case, um, JD, which um, you're going to mention, um, which helps a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, so um, there's a recent case of WH Smith and Commerce Real. That's the decision of His Honour Justice Park, sitting in the county court at Winchester, handed down in March of this year. It concerns WH Smith in Westfield, Shepherds Bush, 
And after some back and forth, the parties agreed that Smiths should get a 50% rent suspension pandemic clause. There's a dispute over the trigger because Smiths is an essential retailer. Um, the judge nevertheless decided that the trigger would be the closure of non-essential retailers. Smiths had a, a post office within it. Everything around it was, um, uh, was non-essential. No one was coming in. The judge then considered what effect that might have on rent. He concluded that the market now expected pandemic clauses. So they had already, as it were, been priced in. There was therefore no need for an uplift to reflect the fact that this lease now had a pandemic clause, even though the comparables relied upon didn't have pandemic clauses. Mm -hmm. So, so far, so good. That helps a bit. Um, but it doesn't tell us about cases where the subject premises have no pandemic clause. And the logic is there should be a discount to the rent there. Um, but there's just no evidence at the moment about how much. I mean, in WH Smith, the, the value was considered it because the, the, the pandemic clause was only agreed at a late stage. And the tenant expert said that there would have been a 10% disc, discount without a pandemic clause. Uh, the judge thought that was going to be far too high. The landlord expert didn't quantify it at all. So we can't really see very much from that case. I mean, it seems to me there ought to be a discount. Um, and just because it's difficult to quantify doesn't mean the courts should just give up. They have to do their best. We always encounter, or often encounter, quite difficult questions of valuation, and you've just got to do what you can. So it, it seems to me it'd be down to the valuers to try and assess uh, factors like what the risk of a trigger event arising during the term of the new lease is, how long the pandemic might last, bearing in mind that we might be a bit better at dealing with a new pandemic now following this experience, or alternatively, absolutely not, you know, who, who knows? There might be a rent cap as well on the pandemic clause, which would limit it. You've got to think about what effect um, uh, a pandemic might have on the tenant and what amount of rent might, might be suspended in each case. And you put all of that together and you try and assess what a landlord might give up in rental terms to avoid including a pandemic clause, typically in increments of two and a half percent for some unknown reason, but it's just what valuers always seem to do. So at the moment, it's all to play for. Um, I, I actually have a trial coming up in September, which I'm hoping is going to deal with this point. Hopefully there'll be some cases before then. So for now, watch this space. Excellent. OK, without further ado, um, the third of our three um, topics, Ben. Vacancies. Now, it's easy to see that vacancies, uh, the, the vacancy situation is not good at the moment. Um, vacancies in retail parks, more so on the high street and even worse in shopping centres, are at their highest, I think, since 2013. I was looking at some figures recently, which put vacancies in shopping centres as high as 16% or just shy of 16%. Uh, what's more, it looks like the vacancies are major ones. We've got numbers of employees affected uh, going up indicating that it's the big stores that are going under. We've got the list of CVAs and administrations. It's long, it's getting longer. And we've got potentially more to come once the ban on commercial evictions uh, comes to an end. The vacancy figures don't also tell us how many temporary lettings there are on low or nominal rents or how many tenants have renegotiated rents to much lower levels. I was discussing this feature of the market with a, a commercial tenant um, only a couple of days ago. Um, so pretty much always Tenants in renewal cases will go on about the state of the market. There's loads of supply and no demand. And in those circumstances, the rent must be rock bottom, surely. So the, I've said it before, I'll say it again. You're always doom and gloom, doom and gloom. Um, but look, I mean, is that right, though? If the next door premises are vacant and have been for some time, does that mean that the subject premises should be valued at practically zero? I mean, the short answer is, is no. Um, and we can get some guidance from a Supreme Court case called Hewitt and Tellerio Trillium, um, which is a ratings case. Um, and there the Supreme Court considered the valuation of premises on the factual basis that there was no demand for them. And they held in essence that uh, one, the valuation assumes that there is a willing tenant, even if no one would in, in fact be interested in the premises. Two, however, the valuation has still got to be carried out in the context of the supply and demand in the market. And three, really the way that you kind of square this circle and go about it is you have to look to your comparables as evidence of what might be paid in the market. The fact that there's no demand doesn't mean the premises have a zero uh, value. And while we're at it, just remember 
that the um, sitting tenant is uh, as part is is considered to be part of the pool of potential bidders or hypothetical bidders for the premises for the purposes of the 54 act valuation so in, in often you will actually have a little bit of demand um, in any event yeah no absolutely so we need to look at the comparables now let's suppose we have a really good comparable mm -hmm. it's the premises next door it's agreed last week so that's a transaction that has been carried out in the context of the existing vacancy rates. So you might say it doesn't actually matter what the vacancy rates are, high or low, that particular comparable takes them into account, whatever they might be. Or put another way, if that's the quality of comparable you have, I bang up to date and pretty much next door, then logically the vacancy rate of itself shouldn't need to be some additional component that also needs to be added into the analysis. Yeah, or put it even another way, the vacancies come out in the wash in that sort of situation. Yeah. But the vacancy rate becomes much more important where the comparable isn't perfect, which is always the case, um, because it's different to the subject premises um, that are being valued. Yeah, and um, the obvious point of difference would be the date. So if the comparable tra transaction is 18 months old, say, then present day demand might be lower, present day supply might be higher than it was at the time of the comparable transaction that would suggest that a lower rent would be applicable. Yeah, second factor to think about is quantum. So when we talk about quantum, we, all talk about, we mean the size of the premises. So if you've got a situation where the comparables are all of small units, because there is a market for small units, but the premises being valued are large and the presence of vacancy, vacancies of large units in the area can tell you that a lower rent than is implied by the smaller comparables might be applicable. And the way that the valuers will deal with that is by way of quantum discount to translate your, your whatever it is, your zone A rate for the smaller units into the larger units. But the quantum discount might be greater if you've got lots of vacancies of the sort of size of the subject premises. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, perhaps one last way in which vacancies might be relevant is to use them as quasi comparables. So you wouldn't have a completed transaction, but the analysis would be that if a unit has been vacant for some time and has an asking zone A rate of, say, £25 per square foot and is failing to let, then that would seem to imply in the current market that the zone A rate for the area can't be more than £25 per square foot and indeed is likely to be less. So I think the message in short is to think carefully about why vacancies are relevant and how they might be used as a tool of analysis rather than simply throwing in loads and loads of evidence about the apparent state of the market generally without thinking exactly what it is you're trying to take from that evidence. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, last judgment plug from me. I'm actually getting- Go for it, Ben. I'm gonna do it. I'm getting a judgment from his own judge diet on Monday. Um, and he's asked amongst many other issues to deal with this very issue. So um, uh, watch this space. Meanwhile, if you've got any questions, please do ask them using the question and answer function. I've seen um, something come through um, already. And then once uh, James and Francesca have discussed interim rent, um, we can uh, come back to them. So over to James and Francesca. Thank you, Jonathan and Ben, and fingers crossed, Ben, for Monday. So James and I are going to talk about another aspect of 1954 Act renewals, interim rent. We've been discussing this and we think it seems pretty inevitable that we can expect to see a rise in meaningful rent applications as a result of market volatility. Absolutely, Francesca. And it's also, I suspect, going to lead to tactical gaming by parties who are going to try and elongate the proceedings for as long as possible if they think that the interim rent is going to be better than the market rent. Um, but before we talk about some of those tactical games, would it be useful just to run through some of the key provisions in the Act and identify some of the important considerations for valuation? Yes, good idea. So there are two starting points really in the Act. I will just share my screen, hopefully, uh, to pull them up while we talk about them. Um, so hopefully you can all see that now. So the first is section 24A, which gives either party the right to apply for interim rent after section 25 or a 20, section 26 notice has been served. And as long as the tenancy continues under section 24. The second is section 24C, which applies when a new tenancy of the whole property is granted without opposition. That provides that the ordinary position is that the interim rent is the rent under the new tenancy, 
but provides for a different interim rent in two circumstances. So first, um, if the market rent as assessed under section 34 at the appropriate date would be substantially different from the rent under the new tenancy, or second, if the terms of the new tenancy dif differ sufficiently that the market rent as assessed under section 34 is substantially different from the market rent the court would have ordered for the old tenancy at the date it assessed the rent for the new tenancy. Now, a typical model of clarity of 1954 Act drafting. Um, there's a lot going on in that, Francesca, and let's just try and unpick a couple of the concepts. First, the notion of the appropriate date, and the, um, what, what is that in the Act, Francesca? Yes, you can see from subsection four, the meaning of appropriate date is dealt with in section 24B. If the landlord is given a section 25 notice, it's the earliest date of termination that could have been given, not the date that's actually given. So you can't play the system to avoid a potentially lower interim rent by extending your date of termination. And likewise, if it's the tenant that's given a section 26 request or notice, it's the earliest date they could have spelt out uh, in that for the start of a new tenancy. Cool. Now, the next concept which it might be worth picking out is this notion of substantially, the, the threshold for getting your interim rent. Now, substantial, it's one of those lovely words that gets the parliamentary draftsman out of a corner, um, but it rather sticks us lawyers in the corner instead. Um, there's nothing, as far as I can see, in the Act that tells us what it means, and perhaps echoing something Ben was saying about um, precedence on the Act, um, there's no definitive answer yet in the case law. Yes, indeed. But... It is a concept which you know, we as lawyers are pretty familiar with. So there are two other areas of law in particular where you might draw an analogy. The first, take an application to vary a restrictive covenant, for example, under the limited benefit ground in section 84, subsection one of the 1925 Act. Now that requires the tribunal to consider whether a covenant secures practical benefits of substantial value or advantage. And the tribunal there has no difficulty in applying that test. And there is some support uh, for a threshold being somewhere in the region north of 10%. And second, if you take a claim for a loss of chance, where a claimant has to show a substantial chance, again, you can find authority for the threshold being somewhere between 10 and 20%. So if you're dealing with one of these applications, it might be a mistake to confine yourself to Reynolds and Clark. You might need to dig out your Preston and Newsom and your McGregor on damages as well. But I suppose what that really emphasises is the importance of evidence. Because if you want an interim rent that's different from your Section 34 rent for the new tenancy, you're going to need some pretty robust valuation evidence to persuade the court, not just that the rent's going to be different, but it's going to be sufficiently, di sufficiently different to get you over that threshold. Absolutely. And it's important to remember, of course, that the burden of proof is on the party wanting to get the interim rent. So some vague assertion of, of market volatility or sort of pleading COVID isn't going to cut it. You'll need your valuer to have a well-reasoned view that's backed up by some pretty decent comps. And here, perhaps, there's an issue with your choice of valuer, and I'm going to um, I hear myself echoing in this slightly different con context something that Ben and JD were just talking about. Because one of the things I find whenever an issue with changes in the market arises, for example, simply when you're um, adjusting comps to reflect changes in time, is that there's a real temptation for valuers just to take national figures and adjust with those. So, you know, the value will say, well, these figures show that nationally there's been a 10% fall in retail rent in the last year. So if you think that the rent um, today was a thousand pounds, you should think that the rent last year was 1,110 pounds. But those national figures gloss over a whole raft of sectorial and local variation. And for my part, I think what you really need when you're dealing with trends in the market like this is a valuer with real local knowledge and experience, someone who can say what's actually driving transactions in the particular market you're dealing with. And I have to say, I find that judges much prefer that kind of valuer um, as someone with, with more reliable hands-on knowledge than maybe the, the big name hired gun brought in from the well-known national firm. That's really useful to know, James. I'll bear that in mind. And actually, the importance of a good valuer 
takes us neatly on to the topic of valuation. And um, so section 24C gives us something of a formula for valuing the interim rent. How you do it depends on why the interim rent was awarded. So if the reason was that the market rent as assessed under section 34 would be different at the appropriate date, then the interim rent is that different rent. But if the reason was that the terms of the new tenancy differ substantially so that the market rent under section 34 would be different, the rent is that which it is reasonable to pay. But that discretion is pretty seriously tramlined and there's effectively a presumption that it's the rent that would have been determined if a tenancy on the terms of the old tenancy had been ordered. Well, let's go on and talk tactics. Now, the first point I suppose is when you make your application. Because in a volatile market, you simply won't know whether or not the interim rent is going to favour you or the other side until you get to the date of trial and you get your Section 34 rent determined. Yeah, and the Act, though, gives you quite a lot of leeway here because there's no earlier date for the application. And then you have up to six months from the date um, from the termination of the relevant tenancy to make your application. So you have a fair bit of time after the, term, after the determination of the rent by the court to work out whether or not you want to make your application. But just thinking of the wisdom of using that time, what about this scenario? Suppose neither side makes an application um, by the time the court determines the Section 34 rent because of the uncertainty. Then suppose it becomes very clear that it's in the interests of one party, let's say it's the landlord, to make that application and they say in correspondence in the ordinary way, we're going to make an application for interim rent. Oddly, in those circumstances, might it be in the interests of the tenant to jump in and go first with their application? Because once the tenant has made the application, the way the act works is that the landlord is precluded from making the application and indeed vice versa. So if you make an application and then somehow manage procedurally to string it out for more than six months beyond the end, beyond the termination of the old tenancy, you could then abandon your application, say we're not going to continue with it. And by that time, it's too late for the other side to apply. So they don't get their interim rent. I can say it in theory. It, it feels like you need... You know, a lot of stars to align and surely surely one would hope that the courts would be astute to that kind of, of tactical game playing and plus if you if you were to abandon your application late in the day you're inevitably going to be left picking up the costs of it well i'm sure you're right with that francesca but at the moment I and mean, you never quite know and we all know that the county courts and the judges doing property work in particular are under a lot of pressure and for example, I've got a trial starting in front of His Honour Judge Dyke on Monday morning, and we've been kicked out for him to give judgment that afternoon on a far less important case involving far less important barristers. Um, but in any way, in any event, um, you just never know what might happen at the moment. You don't know what's around the corner. And more fundamentally, if the other side are going to make the application anyway, what's to lose by jumping in first and giving yourself the chance of getting them on a technicality? True, and I suppose then that has implications for the party that actually wants the interim rent, who thinks it might favour them. So they then need to act fast to protect themselves from that tactic. And that might even involve making the application before they've even announced the intention to do so in written correspondence. Well, I can see that could well be a sensible thing to do, even if it doesn't um, sort of sit with one's instincts in the ordinary way. It's also probably something you'd want to bear in mind when you're deciding at the outset of proceedings whether you're going to delay making an application for, in, in, for interim rent at all. Just taking a slightly different tack, the other thing to think about, I suppose, if you're the party who thinks that interim rent is going to be good news for you, is to drag the proceedings out as long as possible. Because uh, as we've seen, interim rent is, a, is payable from the appropriate date to the end of the tenancy. And we know that under section 64, um, one way that you can lengthen the time until the tenancy determines is by applying for permission to appeal. So even if your application for permission to appeal is somewhat towards the hopeless end of the spectrum, until it's determined, the clock won't start ticking on the new tenancy and you can continue to collect your higher interim rent. So what might look like a hopeless application for permission to appeal might nonetheless be something worth doing.
Yes, and so we've, we've touched on the party sort of waiting and seeing what the rent will be. And I wonder if that opens up a slightly broader topic about a little known corner of the act, albeit I know it's well known to you, James. And by that, I mean the right of revocation under section 36, subsection two. Let me just try and share my screen again so that we can see it. There we go. So section 36 to allows a tenant to go through the entire renewal process. And then if they don't like the end result to apply for a revocation of that order. So in theory, a tenant can and subject, of course, to a cost risk, a tenant can delay their decision as to whether or not they want to continue being a tenant until they know what the terms of the new tenancy are and critically what the new rent is going to be. There are a couple of things in the tale, aren't there, Francesca? And the first we can see in the text that you've underlined on the slide, which is that there is provision for the tenancy to continue, not under Section 64 in the way we're familiar with, but for a period which is necessary to afford to the landlord a reasonable opportunity for reletting or otherwise disposing of the premises. So there's one thing in the tale. And the second is that under Section 24D3, I think it is, interim rent, a new interim rent, will be payable for the period of that continuation. Yeah, so let's talk about the interim rent first. So let's look at section, um, so let's go straight into the provisions then of section 24D. So I think this is quite a complicated provision, but I think you can say um, three things about it really. So the first is that the overall test is that the interim rent is what would be reasonable for a tenant to pay. Second, the starting point is that the market rent as assessed under section 34 for a tenancy, uh, that the market rent is assessed under section 34 for a tenancy from year to year of the whole property. And third, the court can order a different rent if it considers that reasonable having had regard to the rent payable under the old tenancy and any rent payable under any sub-tenancy as well. So there are a few important differences there from the kind of orthodox interim rent valuation. And first of all, you've got this concept of the year to year tenancy. And secondly, you've got a broader discretion for the court to decide what's reasonable. Um, just thinking about the first of those differences a bit more, the notion of the year to year tenancy. I mean, obviously, the effect of that's going to be a matter of evaluation evidence. But I can well see that one might immediately assume that the effect of having a year to year tenancy rather than a fixed term tenancy is going to drive the rent down because with less security, the tenant's going to pay less. But I'd query whether that's necessarily a safe assumption. And even before the pandemic, um, I've seen a, a valuer, a serious reputable valuer, um, say in the context of a particular office building, that actually a year to year tenancy would result in a higher rent than a fixed term, because the nature of the market was that people would pay for flexibility. Now, as I say, that was before the pandemic. So now you can see that logic might well be strengthened. Um, yeah. No, sorry, James, interrupt you there. No, 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 no. I was just going to say, and the other fact that you mentioned, of course, is, you know, how secure the tenant feels. So the opposite of wanting flexibility is also wanting flexibility plus security. And, and that will have a bearing on how much they're then willing to pay. So, so whether or not the year to year tenancy, crucially, is assumed to be protected under the 54 Act. And there's let's say something of an unhappiness in the drafting of the st um, statute here. So section 36, subsection two says in terms that while the current tenancy continues, it shall not be a tenancy to which this part of the act applies. When it comes to rent, there's no equivalent carve out. So the provisions of section 24D that we were just looking at require the court to imagine the rent it would have granted under section 34 if a new tenancy were granted by order of the court and that tenancy would have security. So which provision do you think wins out, James? Well, as far as I'm aware, again, it's a moot point. There's no authority on it. Um, you can see that someone might well say that that carve out wording in section 36.2 isn't really going to rent, it's going, to make clear that the tenant cannot, having revoked the tenancy, then serve a new section 26 request and get a new tenancy, if you like, by the back door. But on the other hand, why should a tenant pay for security of, ten of tenure when the statute expressly says that they don't have it? 
Yes, and, and what also about the discretion then to depart from the Section 34-esque rent? So that discretion used to apply uh, to interim rent generally and was considered to be you know, a cushion which allowed the court to temper the tenant against the shock of a large increase in rent. That logic though is, is pretty difficult to apply to our situation because I think we're supposing that the rent's falling but it's just not falling enough for the tenant to accept a new tenancy. Do you think this can have any application at all? Well, I've been wondering whether there might be a scope in conditions like the present for an argument for a reverse cushion, because the fall in rental values is bad news for landlords. And it's particularly bad news, I'd imagine, for institutional landlords who are relying on a steady stream of rental income to provide a steady stream, uh, uh, to, 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 to meet their steady stream of outgoings. You think in particular about pension fund landlords who know they've got to pay pensions and are relying on the income to do so. And why shouldn't they, or as I would say, if I was arguing the case, the pensioners that they represent, why shouldn't they be cushioned against the fall in the rent? So on that part of the statement, the interim rent payable under Section 36, I think we're probably in agreement that the severity of it can't really be judged. But you might expect that it that it should um, be a lower interim rent than calculated under Section 24C, given, as we said, the switch to a year to year tenancy and the fact that the whole point of the section is to allow the tenant to escape from an onerous rent. But that there is a fair bit, though, that the landlord could say to dispute it. And then let me try once more and share my screen, because then the other part of this thing, which we talked about, the continuation of the tenancy and hence you know, the payment of the interim rent for such period as may be so agreed or determined to be necessary to afford the landlord a reasonable opportunity for reletting or disposing of the premises. The word reasonable, um, again, a great way for the parliamentary draftsman to get out of a corner, um, but a headache for us lawyers. And what really is a reasonable opportunity for reletting? We all know that there are a variety, a huge variety of ways you might go about a letting strategy. You might start with a low ask for your rent to get a quick letting. You might start with a high ask for your rent, accepting a void period in the hope that you'd get a higher rent in due course. You might decide to jazz the premises up to do your repair work to make them look smarter before you start your marketing. You might decide it doesn't really matter, we'll do it all at once. All of that is reasonable and all of that can affect how long your letting period is. It's just another sea of uncertainty, isn't it, Francesca? I'm not so sure. I think the draftman, the draftsman's been a little bit more careful, perhaps, than you're giving him or her credit for, James, because the words are a reasonable opportunity. So on the face of things, you simply have to identify the minimum time, let's say, for one of the reasonable marketing strategies available to bear fruit, even if there are, as you say, a number of other reasonable marketing strategies which might take longer. Well, maybe you've got a point, Francesca, maybe I've been too harsh, but that does raise the question of what exactly is a reasonable marketing strategy? What's the difference between reasonable and unreasonable in this context? Of course, well, here evidence of marketing practice or market practice is going to be key. If the tenant can find comparable evidence of the strategy it advocates in fact being used in the market, the landlord is going to need some pretty compelling reasons to say why that's not reasonable. And conversely though, if the tenant strategy is not one it can evidence being adopted in the market, it's going to be the one with the problem. Well, I can see that. Um, but either way, it's going to be highly dependent on the evidence that either side adduces. And at the very least, the tenant who uses the Section 36 mechanism is going to face uncertainty as to the length of time they're going to find themselves still subject to potentially onerous lease of rent obligations. I agree. And um, well, I suppose, as always, we'll have to wait and see um, how matters play out over the coming months and which tactics are deployed and more importantly, which tactics succeed. Indeed, Francesca. Well, that's been very interesting. Um, shall we open it out to any questions that anyone has for any uh, um, on either of the talks? Well, we've had um, we've had one question in um, on what uh, Jonathan and I were discussing, um, which concerns uh, what clause would a fixed or stepped rent come under? So we were talking about. Section 34.1 and Section 34.3 and the difference between the market 
um, uh, uh, practice be, um, governing Section 34.1, but Section 34.3 being more about a matter of discretion. Um, this um, topic, actually, here we go. Here's another judgment plug. On Monday, I'm getting judgment on this issue as well. So, of course uh, you are, Ben. Of course you are. This is it. It's, it's the answer to everything. It's the answer to everything. So it's a very well-timed um, and very interesting question. Um, our case um, concerns, uh, in essence, the landlord is asking for um, fixed rental increases annually, 1.5% annually. And there is a question there as to what provision um, that should come under. And that's, in essence, the same thing as a step rent. Um, my view is it's pretty clear, and I'm just waiting to be proved wrong, so uh, let's see. But um, there's a case called Fork, um, F-A-W-K-E, and Chelsea, or Viscount of Chelsea, which concerns what was referred to there as a differential rent. And a differential rent there was one where, in essence, no rent was going to be payable until certain repairs were carried out. And the evidence was that, that is what the market would have done. And the Court of Appeal unanimously concluded that if the market would have had that stepped differential rent, then that is not only what the court could order, but what the court must order under Section 34.1. So in essence, it was not a provision for um, varying the rent under Section 34.3, but it was just setting what the market rent was under section 34.1. And I think the, the important point there is at that date of the decision, you knew what the rent was going to be. You might not know actually when the repairs were going to be carried out, when the trigger date is, but, you, but the rent was being set by fixed amount. The difference is for a rent review clause, you don't actually know what that amount will be. You only know what the mechanism for fixing it is. So I think a, a fixed or stepped rent is going to come under the market provisions under Section 34.1, whereas a rent review, and I think also arguably turnover, is going to come under Section 34.3. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Ben. Now, I promised we'd finish at 10.30, but we do still have a few more minutes, so let's keep going for a little bit. Uh, another question that we had come in was, how common are pandemic clauses in pre-COVID leases? Um, I think my thoughts on that are, uh, one could give, as it were, the cover all bases answer, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't, but I think actually we can do a little bit better than that. Um, I would make two points. The first point I would say is that a bespoke pandemic clause, headed as such, in my experience, is very rare indeed. In fact, I'm hard pushed to think whether I've ever seen that sort of clause in, if it were, sort of a standard UK high street commercial lease. Um, however, if one broadens it out a bit and thinks about business interruption and force majeure clauses, uh, they don't appear under a, pan, under a banner in size 14 font saying pandemic laws. Indeed, they sometimes don't appear under any banner at all, but they might, they might do some of the same work. So a force majeure clause, um, as our audience will know, is a contractual term which excuses or suspends performance. Uh, of an obligation on the occurrence of a, a particular specified event uh, beyond the party's control. So the question is what falls within that clause? You can see it as it were as a, a sort of a more general version of a pandemic clause. It will cover things like acts of God, terrorism, war, riot, disease, and with disease you might get epidemics and pandemics and so on and so forth. So really worth looking out for. Um, now if you do find one of those clauses, all the sorts of things that Ben and I were talking about, the nature of the trigger, uh, the extent of the relief and so on and so forth. All of these points will be in play again. So do have a look at that. And if you want more, then go to the Wilberforce YouTube channel where you can find myself and Julian, Julian Greenhill uh, talking about this very topic in, in a previous uh, production. Um, and as ever, do let us know your views. If you've got particular thoughts on this, throw them into the chat function now. That would be absolutely great. Um, so there's a few thoughts on that question. Um, any other uh, questions out there? Yeah, yeah we, we, just, just, we just had one come in. Um, oh, sorry, James, did you have something to add on, on that? No, I, I was going to address the one that's just come in. Um, but yeah, on, well, there's, there's one from Guy Joseph, um, and I, I have to say oh. thank you for this. It's a really, really interesting point. Um, and, it's, uh, and, and I think it's more of a point than a question, but it is actually worth just raising because I can see a, a lot of sense in it. Um, um, Guy is saying that another difficulty with imposing turnover rents is not just the issue with the disregards in Section 34.1a and b, 
but also C, the disregards for improvements, because if you have a turnover being generated from premises, those premises, that turnover will necessarily be uh, reflected um, in the improvements, any tenants' improvements that have been made. But the, di but the disregards tell you where the where relevant ten tenants' improvements made with the relevant time, etc., by the relevant person, that you have to disregard the existence of those improvements. So you've got a tenant that puts in a lovely new shop front, escalators, all sorts of vertical circulation, all that kind of stuff. You disregard that for purposes of rent, but how can you really fix a turnover rent um, uh, where those improvements? improvements aren't necessarily there. I think that's a really interesting point um, and um, uh, something which is going to have to be addressed um, if this comes up in court. Great stuff. I think we've got time for one more, possibly. James, go for it. Um, we've, we've had one from Emma Humphreys who's asked about how interim rent is likely to work where the court decides that the new rent should be changed to a turnover rent. And again, I mean, that, that, that's a very interesting conundrum. Um, but I suppose in broad terms, you could probably divide it into two scenarios. The first is where the court, in deciding what Section 34 rent it would have awarded at the appropriate date, i.e. the start date for interim rent, decides that that would itself have been a turnover rent. So it's the same answer. And there, the comparison would hopefully be straightforward because you could look at, um, at, at what percentage of the turnover rent would have been at each time. Um, the more difficult situation might be if you have a situation where the court decides that even though today it's going to be a turnover rent, back in time at the appropriate date, it would have been a straight ordinary non-turnover rent. Um, I suppose what you might be able to do in that situation is look at what the turnover rent has determined would have generated in total rental income in the period for which interim rent would have been payable. And there's a little bit going forward where you'd have to estimate, but you, you could get a pretty good um, picture of what that looked like as a total amount and compare that with the total amount of rental income that would have come under the fixed rent and then decide if the, diff if, if the difference between the two was substantial. Fantastic. I am going to keep my promise. I said we'd finish at 10.30, it's 10.29. Um, do of course get in touch with us if there's anything else uh, you would like to talk about. Um, all I will say now is thank you very much for attending today's seminar. We very much value your feedback. A short questionnaire will pop up in your browser once the session is over. Uh, we'd appreciate your views on how you found the session, so uh, do please let us know. And also any topics you'd like us to tackle in the future, do let us know. The recording of this webinar will be available to view on the YouTube channel uh, in case you've missed it or want to see it again. So go to YouTube, type in Wilberforce Chambers, and you'll find all sorts of interesting and occasionally surprising content there. Um, as I mentioned at the start, today has formed part of a series of webinars from our property group. Uh, the third in the series will take place on the 15th of June, um, where our friends Julian Greenhill QC, Ema Murphy and Harriet Holmes will be discussing leasehold guarantees. Keep an eye out for the invitation to that session, which should be circulated during the next week or so. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.